I'm a park ranger here in the Northern Cascades. I frequently respond to emergencies, search and rescue, and also do some law enforcement work myself. This summer, I was working on a trail crew about 20 miles from the husband campground. I dropped back a few hundred yards from the crew to relieve myself, and I noticed a large, sickly sweet odor in the air. It kind of smelled like bear feces, but it was different. As I stood there, I heard crunching twigs from down the trail, and that's when I saw this large dark figure walking upright in my direction. I turned and began to hide behind a tree. As I turned back to look, it was maybe only about ten feet away. It was black, a bit shorter than I, with no visible neck that I could see. It stopped at the tree I was hiding behind, sniffing the air with its nose pointing up. I could not see any visible eyes. I was rooted to the spot in fear and could not physically move a muscle. And then it turned around and walked away casually in the same manner it had arrived. I stood there for a few more minutes to see if it would circle back around and then ran back to my crew. I refused to tell anybody what I'd seen. I hope nobody has to experience such a thing. Eight years ago, I found myself in Bend, Oregon, a place that seemed to harbor whispers of the unknown. As I explored the charming town, I stumbled upon an intriguing tale that would ignite my curiosity and lead me on an adventure I could never have imagined. I had the chance to strike up a conversation with a lady who had camped near Paulina Peak, a majestic peak that stood tall at 7,897 feet. The thought of camping amidst such breathtaking scenery excited me, but it was her story that truly captured my attention. She recounted a night, eight years prior, when her peaceful camping trip took an unexpected turn. In the early morning hours, a blood-curdling scream echoed through the wilderness. The sound was like nothing she had ever heard before, and it sent shivers down her spine. Frightened and perplexed, she decided to share her experience with the local forest service rangers from the Deschutes National Forest. The rangers were attentive as she described the terrifying scream she had heard. They revealed to her a plaster cast of a Bigfoot track, left by a creature that had been spotted crossing a road by two of the rangers themselves. With conviction, they assured her that the scream she heard was probably from the very creature that left that intriguing track. Intrigued and captivated, I was eager to learn more about this mysterious encounter. I sought to track down the retired ranger who had witnessed the Bigfoot track, hoping to hear more about this enigmatic creature roaming the woods of Oregon. However, my efforts to follow this lead were met with obstacles. The Forest Service personnel seemed tight-lipped, unwilling to share any further information. So basically I was with a group of friends walking from one condominium to another. There was a forest between these condominiums, with a fence dividing it from the sidewalk. I was behind the group with one of my friends. We were walking through a slightly dark part of the street, and suddenly both of us saw some, some white thing in one of the trees. It looked like a slime, and it was moving in a really weird way, had no legs, no face, and it was a really powerful white like there's no chance it was a light or something else. I called for the other guys, and as I shouted it started climbing really fast in a really bizarre way as if I scared it. I turned on the lights from the phone to see if I could find it, but honestly I was scared too and my heart started beating fast, so I just started running away with my friend. It was so good to have him there, because we talked later and both of us saw the same thing, and even complimented each other as we talked. So I was sure I was not hallucinating. Of course, none of our friends who were in front of us believed in what we said. Some of them got intrigued, but I wouldn't blame them for not believing it, as I wouldn't blame you. It was really strange, it was like that venom slime but white. It's my only encounter with something that I just can't explain what it was. It really looked like it was not from Earth. My husband bought me a voodoo doll a couple birthdays ago in New Orleans. It was a vampire to keep you safe at night. I thought it was cute, but I did not put too much stock in it being real. Anyway, fast forward to a couple weeks ago. 
For some backstory, my husband was a Boy Scout. He has no fear of the wilderness and is strictly a don't worry until you have to person. We had been camping for several days at this point, so I was not spooked either. It was a very normal happy night. When we arrived at this campsite, I got the idea to grab our vampire. We normally keep him hanging in our car. He would not budge. I'm talking my husband and I both tried to get this clip to open for a good 10 minutes, and it just wouldn't. We thought maybe it had melted together in the heat, joked that he needs to stay in the car for some reason we are unaware of, and we went about our day. Fast forward several hours, we are in our tent at Sipsy Wilderness with our kids just hanging out after they went to sleep. With no prompt, no scary rustling in the bushes, no bad feeling, nothing, I get the urge to ask my husband if he's scared. I suddenly feel my hair standing up. He says, yes. Without even talking to each other about what we should do, we both instantly grabbed the kids and ran for what felt like our lives to the car. Tossed the still sleeping kids in the back seat, my husband buckling them in the car as I'm driving away. I'm big on car seat safety, but I didn't even wait. I just had a feeling we had seconds to get out of there. We didn't even get a chance to discuss what was going on when a random car passes us leaving the empty campsite. This is 2 a.m. in the freaking remote wilderness in nowhere, Alabama. The entire campsite was empty that whole day. I just drive faster at this point, leaving all our belongings behind. We arrive at the closest Walmart, maybe a 30 minutes drive, and the employees are outside. Walmart is closed. Seriously, there are about 10 employees outside just staring blankly at our car. If anyone has an explanation for this, please let me know. It was eerie, but this may not be anything. I guess there might be overnight stocking where 10 employees are taking a smoke break or something at the same time, but it just seemed off. We parked in the lot away from the employees as not to spook them, but they just kept staring. They didn't speak to each other or move. I decided to keep driving. I felt like I was in the twilight zone. I had no idea what to do at this point, so we just kept driving around and napped in the car with keys and ignition ready to book it if we needed to until the sun came up. We returned to the campsite, packed our stuff as fast as we could, and we never went back. We have since spent all our camping time at Chia with no instances like this one. The weirdest part. That next morning, my husband tested our voodoo doll clip, and he came right off the car immediately. It's almost like he refused to leave our car that night to keep us safe. This probably doesn't explain everything the way it actually happened to us, but in summary, we got a really weird urge to run, saw some weird stuff, and now I'm afraid to go back to Sipsy. What do y'all think? So I was hunting with my dad up in the mountains a few years back, and we had called it a night and returned to camp. After more than a few beers and some whiskey, we went to bed. Now we weren't sleeping in tents or anything, just some ancient army cots under the stars. After dosing off, I hear our old ice chest open and then thud shut. And that old ice chest had a very loud and squeaky hinges, so it was very noticeable. I assumed it was my dad getting a water bottle. A few seconds later it happens again and repeats a few more times. So I turn over to ask my dad how is he so drunk that he can't operate an ice chest to find he's still asleep and snoring next to me. I reach for my mag light and shine it on the ice chest to find a black bear rummaging through it. He takes one look at me and runs off with something while I yell at him. Later the next day we find the bottle of Crown Royal a few feet away from camp unopened. We always share a laugh about that alcoholic bear. Truck driver in the US. I had just started trucking and had been at it a few months. I was with a company that makes you ride teams for the first six months. The guy they team me with isn't a bad guy, but like everyone, there are always some things you don't like about other people. These things aren't horrible, but little things. Well, we were at a shipper one day at a slaughterhouse. The smell. I don't see how the employees manage it. We get hooked to our trailer and I head in to get my paperwork. 
leave only to find out, thankfully before I left, that the seal number was different than what was on the papers. I go back in to correct this mistake, and as I walk in there is another trucker following me in. While I wait on my paperwork again, this guy and I strike up a conversation. In the middle of the convo, or rather towards the end, I happen to mention my mild frustrations about my partner. I want to paint a picture of this guy real quick. Six feet not fat, but has a bit of a trucker's pudge going on, and around 50 years on him. His arms, I didn't really notice at first, had hundreds of small inch long cut scars. All different directions all over what I could see of his arms. He wore a short sleeved t-shirt. He also had some of these small scares on the neck around the collar of his shirt, but not so many. Bit of a wild look in his eye. Anyways, back to the story. And hearing my frustrations, this man proceeded to tell me that I have to let it go. I said, yeah, it really isn't that big a deal, so I don't think about it, the guy. Just let the demons out. He gestures a fist and drags it across his gut, as if he were holding a knife and cutting himself with it. Guy, you got to let the demons out and let them fall and walk away. Gesturing every word he is saying. The man then proceeded to pull his shirt up, and I now witnessed the same scaring from his arms on his stomach. All over. Hundreds. What got me the most was the really big one. Right in line with where he dragged his fist. I was in shock realizing the situation. This man has done this to himself and is probably speaking literally. As my brain is racing, all I think is I need to be gone from here. So I nod my head in agreement, because I don't know what he would do if I didn't, and promptly ask for my paperwork with a staunch voice. Nothing came of it, but that man is seriously disturbed and I think needs professional help. I hope he got it. It was the first and only time that I had ever genuinely feared for my life interacting with another individual on a face-to-face -face basis. It was a chilly afternoon in the heart of the forest, and I was hiking along a scenic trail, enjoying the solitude and the beauty of nature. The rustling leaves under my boots and the distant chirping of birds created a peaceful ambience around me. Little did I know that this tranquil hike would lead me to an inexplicable encounter that would forever remain etched in my memory. As I trekked deeper into the wilderness, I noticed a tree line not far from the trail. My curiosity sparked, and I decided to venture closer to take a peek at the dense vegetation beyond. My heart skipped a beat when, from the corner of my eye, I saw a large figure moving amidst the trees. At first, I thought it was a bear, and my heart raced with a mix of excitement and fear. But as I focused on the creature, my astonishment grew. This was no ordinary bear. It was running on its hind legs. I rubbed my eyes, thinking I must be seeing things, but there it was, unmistakable. This creature was sprinting, its arms raised above its head like a human running in a race. My mind was a whirlwind of emotions and confusion. My instincts told me to retreat, but my curiosity held me in place, trying to comprehend the bizarre sight before me. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. It defied everything I knew about bears. They don't run on their hind legs, do they? The creature continued its unusual dash along the tree line for what felt like an eternity, but was probably only a few seconds. Then, as abruptly as it appeared, it vanished into the thick foliage. My heart pounded in my chest, and my mind raced with questions. What had I just witnessed? Was it a bear imitating human-like movements, or was it something entirely different? I cautiously made my way back to the main trail, my thoughts consumed by the enigmatic encounter. As I returned to civilization, I couldn't shake off the image of that strange creature. Later that day, I decided to share my story with a few fellow hikers and locals, to my surprise, I was met with skepticism and disbelief. People often mistake things in the woods, they said. Bears don't run on their hind legs. I nodded, trying to accept their rational explanation, but deep down, I knew what I saw was real. The memory of that bear-like creature, running on its hind legs with its arms raised above its head, remained vivid in my mind.
During the summer of 1987, I was hiking with eight other teens and three adult instructors in the Three Sisters Wilderness in Oregon. We were heading up a low ridge around dusk, over to the left and towards the base there was a small pond, and as we reached the top there wad a small lake to the right down the other side of the ridge. The instructors set up camp further up the ridge about 50 yards from us. We were setting up our tarps and collecting water for the night, making dinner act. The sun was down, but it was still light enough to see clearly for maybe 30 more minutes. Alex went to relieve himself, and we could still see the instructors up the hill from us. When all of a sudden a rock about the size of a bowling ball came flying into our camp, we were shocked, then started yelling at Alex. Knock it off, etc. Then another one came and another. The rocks were not too close to us, but close enough to be somewhat of a danger. Then Alex came back, we all got in his face and were really upset. Then another rock came down. We all ran up to where the instructors were at and told them what happened. They of course thought we were full of it, when from out of nowhere again came Anther Rock, not so close, but again close enough. It is getting quite dark now and all sat back to back in a circle, with our ice axes in our hands. I think we stayed up all night but the next day we all just left and never spoke about it again. About 10 years ago, I was living with my aunt and I basically had the basement family room to myself. The house setup was odd because the basement had its own entrance, which was really ground level, and the rest of the house was built into or onto a hill. In order to walk in the formal front door, you would have to go up a flight of stairs, but right off the driveway was the basement door. The house is old, and the lock on the basement door is tricky, and there have been many nights when I just went to sleep and forgot to, or didn't lock the door right, it had to be slammed shut, etc. One night I awake from sleep in a distressed panic, as if I was having a nightmare, but I didn't to the best of my knowledge have a nightmare. Basically, it felt like something bad was transpiring. As I lay in bed, I could hear someone tinkering with the basement lock and door. I listen to verify, and then it becomes painfully aware that someone is outside, trying to get in. I walk over to the door slowly and look out the peephole, but I can't see anything because it is way too dark outside. There is a switch to turn on the floodlight about four feet from the door, so I switch it on and quickly get to the peephole to see who was out there. When I look through the peephole, I see a middle-aged, bald, somewhat husky white male, but I can't see his face because he is looking back at where the light is. I guess he was checking to see who put a light on him or what was going on. I run upstairs, wake up my family, grab a golf club and call the police. They take 30 minutes to get there, shine a spotlight around the yard and leave. I didn't get any sleep that night. My brother-in-law was driving from Suva to Lautoka on Fiji around the back road. The night before, a young girl was seen walking along the road before she was murdered. My brother-in-law, thinking about this story, as he drove the empty road early morning, saw a girl crying as she walked along the road. He stopped to offer help but a big plume of fog blew over and she vanished in it. Then his car started to smell like sweet, cheap children's perfume. He freaked out and sped off. He got about two kilometers down the road, well, out of the fog, and he saw her again, walking, crying. He turned around and went the opposite way around. So my boyfriend and I were hiking on an island of off Tofino, British Columbia. This island is owned by Native Americans, and you pay their community to hike there even though no one actually lives there. You take a 20-30 minute water taxi ride to the island, hike up it, and then call for the water taxi again when you're done. This hike is supposed to be around 4-5 hours round trip. We started at around 12 p.m. When we got to the island, we got super turned around. We ended up seeing this one lone cow or bull, not sure. That had giant horns. It was not happy to see us pass. That was weird. We walked by it and eventually found this desolate home. 
It was probably three stories high, with all of the windows smashed in, full of random crap surrounding it, like a broken swing set. We kept walking and found a broken down truck that was clearly being scrapped for parts. Not one other human. At this point we were pretty creeped out and aware we were lost, so we walked back and found the trailhead and set off in the right direction. However, the trail was not well maintained at all, and we were concerned we were going to get lost. If you haven't been to Canada's raincoast, imagine the jungle, but not as hot. So many leaves and trees and vines and cobwebs overhead that it blocks out the sun sometimes. Tons of mud. Trees broken down over the paths. Beautiful, but easy to get turned around in. We eventually realized we were on the right track, and we did run into some other hikers who passed us on the way up. We're feeling pretty good at this point and head down the mountain before the other hikers. Eventually, this hikers pass us and we can't hear anyone around us. It is getting close to around 6 p.m. and the sun is setting. We took way too long. My boyfriend is going fast and I'm slowing him down. He keeps nagging me to hurry up. Suddenly, he stops and looks back at me and says, Did you hear that? I pause and listen. Nothing. I didn't hear anything. I tell him. He says, It sounded like an animal or like a person breathing. I get the chills hearing that but listen again and don't hear anything. I tell him he must be imagining it and we keep going in silence for maybe another 10 minutes. Again, he stops suddenly and says, listen. I stop and listen and yeah, I heard it. It's super heavy breathing from above us. We both look up and are scanning the literally thousands of trees above us. We can't see anything, but we can hear it. And it is not human. We look at each other and I have never run faster in my life. I was like a bat out of hell and my boyfriend could barely keep up with me. We didn't hear anything again for the rest of the hike but we paused a few times to listen and looked behind us more times than we could have counted. Some of our friends think it might have been a Bigfoot or a Wendigo, but both of those options are still pretty terrifying. My grandfather was driving back from London late at night on a road that was heavily surrounded by woodland when he pulled over to relieve himself. Midstream through the quiet night, he could hear hurried footsteps in the distance coming from the forest. Quickly finishing up, he ran back to his car, all while the footfall was getting closer. Just after he had started to set off, a man burst from the forest and chased after the car as my grandfather sped away. My older sister is a through hiker and goes backpacking often. We grew up in Appalachia in a very remote area. Growing up poor, we spent a lot of time camping, and now that we're older, she lives closer to home and regularly goes camping with my parents. We've had our fair share of bear and wildcat encounters, but nothing like this has happened before. Today, I called out of work with a stomach bug. I woke up from a nap and my sister texted me asking if she could give me a call. I live about five hours away, so I immediately said yes, fearing it was an emergency. When I answered, I could hear her footsteps very fast and her hurried breath in the phone. She said that she was in a ridge taking photos of a cave system she found near a large rock formation. When she made it to a clearing, she heard a man call her name. It echoed through the woods. It was then that she reached out to me. While I was talking to her, I could hear my dad's voice in the background. She said that she was still an hour from her camp. When she said she was alone, I felt the iciest feeling down my neck. I asked her what the man's voice sounded like. She paused and said, it sounded like several voices at the same time, but the loudest sounded like dad. I stayed with her on the phone all the while hearing something that was trying to sound like my dad. He's a lifetime smoker and very tall so he has a low, booming voice that I have always found comforting up until now. When she got to the campsite, I told her that I was hearing it the entire time and thought he was there with her. She laughed and thought I was trying to tease her. But once she believed me, we were both rightfully spooked after that. My dad is very much alive and well. I posted this to another subreddit and was told to go here. How she can protect herself while she's alone in her tent tonight.
I told her to sleep in her car. We work in Hohenwald, Tennessee, and we're coming home from work, driving up a road called Natchez Trace, a few hours ago, 1.30 a.m. Whatever it was, it was tall and fast as hell. I've never seen anything move that fast. It jumped completely over the road. The weirdest part was, it stopped, and we could see it looking at us from the tree line. Had almost human-looking eyes, but bigger. It was standing, and we could see its eyes but it was definitely trying to stay out of sight. It didn't really look like what I would imagine a Bigfoot don't believe in Bigfoot anyway would look like. Maybe more slender, but it moved too quickly to get an accurate description, of course. Seems to be how it goes with strange sightings. It's extra strange because when I was a kid, my grandparents and I witnessed a white creature messing with their chicken coop. It was also tall and fast. Now we're sitting at home freak the F out lol. Anybody ever seen anything like that? Edit. I did some googling and found the Alabama white thing folklore. Now I'm weirded out. Edit. Also to add more info, it definitely seemed to be running on all fours, but it stood up on two legs I guess once in the trees. I'm six foot four, and I'm thinking it had to be about seven foot tall. My aunt lives on a hill overlooking a city in Southern California. It usually takes about 15 minutes of dirt road driving and, and a bit of off-roading to get there. Driving over rocks, through giant trees, and by a burnt-down Depression-era maintenance house, the view is spectacular. But it is isolated due to the difficulty and type of car required to get to the house. Situated above a Depression-era orange grove, it would be very difficult to get to this house without directions and help. My family simply refers to this as the hill due to the isolation and seclusion that accompanies being there at night. When you're there at night, you're staying there. There is no real getting down the hill at night. One winter night, my aunt and uncle were watching TV when a knock came about on their front door. Not only was this completely strange, but nearly impossible due to the navigation required along with the winter cold. My uncle didn't bother locking his door due to the seclusion. Before my aunt could peek a look at the door, three men in all white were overlooking them. They asked, is this the battered women's shelter? Unbeknownst to the intruders, my aunt's two sons were laying on the floor and stood up. These men had met their equal and slowly backed out the door before undertaking the long drive back. The final theory of who these guys were was Manson sympathizers. They probably intended to take advantage of my aunt and met their match. Lucky they were unarmed and not expecting a fight. The hill is a scary place at night. When I was 19 I had to complete basic military service in Austria, just like every Austrian around that age. During my time in the military, we still had border controls, so of course my fellow recruits and me were called to action after we completed our basic training. This was in November, and the border region we were stationed at always had thick fog at this time of the year, and the later evening hours and the night especially. One night I was sent on patrol with a guy I didn't have much to do with at that point. As he wasn't one of my fellow recruits, but a private who volunteered for the operation. They did get paid rather well. Over the course of a single night, patrols were required to visit a number of small cabins that acted as outposts and to stay there for a while. So at one point in the night, we arrive at this one outpost in the middle of nowhere. Only fields and woods in plain view, freezing cold and thick fog as always. At first, we just wanted to hang out in the cabin, but apparently that particular one was inhabited by a family of rats or mice or whatever, as pretty much the whole cabin was covered in fecal matter. So we thought we'd just smoke a cigarette outside and then be on our way to the next outpost. As we're standing in the cold smoking, I suddenly hear weird, but rather remote noises from the fog-covered woods to the left of us. A few moments later, in a flash, the noises hit again although much louder and obviously closing in. Heavy, but fast, determined steps and a weird combination of gasping and deep grunting. 
charging directly in our direction. We instantly stare at each other in shock, and he screams, run. We both bolt to the cabin, lock the door, assault rifle at the ready and unlocked. I like to think that I'm a very collected person, but at this very moment I'd probably have discharged my whole magazine into whatever would have come bursting through that very door. Standing there in suspense, thinking it can't get much worse, the cadet, who seemed like a completely regular guy up to this point, suddenly turns and says, I did not tell you that I'm a vampire, did I? I didn't get what he wanted to imply with this statement at that time, because I had a classmate back in school who apparently also believed to be a vampire, so I was just like, yeah, cool story. But apparently in this very moment, this lunatic genuinely believed that he was a vampire who was being attacked by a werewolf of all things. It was even full moon and I was being locked into the same cabin as him, with an unlocked assault rifle and 30 shots. We waited for at least one hour, and although nothing did attempt to tackle that door ultimately, we did actually see a rather large shadow lurking in the moonlit fog outside through the cabin window for some minutes. It needs to be noted that I grew up in the city and am thus not really accustomed to the sounds of wildlife. From a rational point of view, it must have been a wild boar they can be actually aggressive, depending on the season, as there should be no bears or similar animals in that region anymore. I was never again scared so shitless, though. It was later in the evening when I was driving back to my in-law's house by myself and was going down a dirt road. I saw something in the ditch up ahead and on the right and didn't really know what it was until I got up far enough so that my headlights could catch it. I didn't know anything about dogmen until a couple of years ago. This thing had an outline of a huge dog, but when I got closer, it turned and looked at me. I just floored it. It didn't really bother me until I noticed it looking at me and I saw that it was actually grasping what it was eating. I got back and didn't say exactly what I saw. I just asked them if there were any big dogs or wolves up where they lived. My father-in-law just laughed and said, no. Then he asked why. I didn't say anything. The thing I will never forget are the reddish orange eyes that just kept staring at me. In September 2002, I was living in my camper truck at the top of the McNair Creek Valley near Port Mellon, British Columbia. One foggy morning, I climbed up into the old growth and wandered around eating blueberries and listening. I had my sturdy hiking stick, but was not even carrying any bear spray. After a few hours, I headed back to my camp. I had to walk down a steep scree field at the base of which was my front bumper. Carefully, step by step, I descended the wobbly boulders on my wobbly ankles. I stepped off the last boulder onto a flat old road surface just in front of my truck. When I raised my eyes, I saw that some scraggly bushes, six feet away, were shaking and vibrating. I thought there must be some squirrels fighting in there. That is the only thing that could make bushes vibrate like that. I stepped forward and poked my stick into the branches to separate them. Suddenly, the shaking area grew to a larger area, three feet in diameter. Then this area of violently vibrating bushes moved away from me and accelerated up a steep slope. Out of curiosity, I tried to follow it, looking into the hole it was making in the vegetation. There was nothing in the hole. The running hole in the forest displaced vegetation in the shape of a tall, bipedal, hefty creature. It went up that steep slope as fast as the fastest running man you could ever see. It disappeared from my sight over the top of the slope. Wow, I thought, an invisible Sasquatch and I had been two feet away from it. I must have poked it in the shin with my stick. It was afraid of me. I write this for other people who have experienced the predator. Glimmer man, that's what we call it. From the many accounts I have read, this thing is something different from a Sasquatch. From reading many accounts, it is an alien with cloaking and anti-gravity technology. It watches people and it likes to run through the forest. I found myself panting heavily as I leaned against a tree trunk, my heart pounding in my chest. 
The events of the night had left me shaken to the core, my mind struggling to comprehend the horrors we had just witnessed. It all began when our group of amateur hikers, led by our fearless adventurer Norris, stumbled upon an abandoned ranger station deep within Yellowstone National Park. The ranger station stood before us, weathered and worn by the passage of time. Its windows were shattered, and the door hung loosely on its hinges. Intrigued by the mysterious history that clung to the structure, we made the impulsive decision to spend the night, oblivious to the station's haunting past. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting an eerie glow over the surrounding forest, darkness fell upon us like a suffocating blanket. We gathered inside, our flashlights cutting through the thick veil of shadows that consumed the station. Unease settled upon our group, and an unspoken tension hung in the air. It began subtly, with faint whispers carried on the wind, disembodied voices that seemed to echo from the walls themselves. Goosebumps prickled along my arms as the ethereal sounds intensified, words I couldn't quite make out, but which carried an undeniable sense of anguish. Suddenly, ghostly apparitions flickered into existence before our startled eyes. Figures, translucent and hazy, materialized and disappeared in an instant. We caught glimpses of tormented souls, forever trapped in the realm between life and death, their sorrow etched into their spectral faces. A shudder ran down my spine as my gaze shifted toward the open doorway. Emerging from the darkness was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It crouched, its long, emaciated arms hanging down against its sides, the skin stretched tight over the prominent ribs of its bony chest. What I had initially mistaken for white fur was, in fact, its sickly pale, death-like skin with eerie gray undertones. The creature's head was that of a human, but one ravaged by malnutrition and decay. Its hollow eyes were disproportionately large, reflecting the faint glimmers of sunlight and they seemed to pierce through my very soul. With a guttural growl, it lunged toward us, teeth bared in a sinister snarl. Pure terror surged through our veins, overpowering our sense of curiosity. We turned and fled, racing into the night, driven solely by an instinct to survive. As we burst through the tree line into a small clearing, our heaving breaths were momentarily stilled by the sight of a park ranger jeep parked nearby. Relief flooded over us, and we quickly huddled together, sharing our terrifying encounter with the park ranger. But our hopes of finding solace and reassurance were shattered as he dismissed our story with a scoff. His eyes bore an expression of skepticism, and he chalked it up to hallucinations induced by drug use. We pleaded with him, our voices trembling with desperation, assuring him that we were clear-headed, and what we had experienced was all too real. But the ranger remained unmoved, dismissing us as mere fools who had wandered into the realm of hallucinatory nightmares. Defeated and dejected, we trudged away from the ranger station, our minds forever scarred by the horrors we had faced. I was going through the hiking trails with my dog, behind my town's local high school, fairly late one night. I had gone there plenty of times before since I was young, so I wasn't frightened. While I was walking my dog, he kept trying to stop and was whimpering, which was strange because he is normally a very brave dog. After walking for about 10 minutes longer, I heard huge branches crashing and breaking. That's when I started to become frightened and decided to turn back. While walking back, I could tell that something was following me. I was terrified. Suddenly, after a minute of calmness, this creature leaped in front of me across the trail. The creature had long, dark fur and was enormous. It wasn't a bear. It was like a very muscular, huge wolf. After seeing this, I picked up my dog and sprinted off the trail without seeing it again. That was easily one of the most terrifying nights of my life. This afternoon about 5 p.m., I had went to pick up my daughter from work. She works in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, right near the high school. I parked in the lot which is backed up to a little wooded-like area and was reading Facebook on my phone while I waited. I had this feeling of being watched come over me. I started looking around and turned in my seat to look into the trees to see if I saw anything, 
and I saw this big dark figure standing there watching me. I turned back around in my seat, hoping it didn't realize I seen it, and lifted my phone up just enough to film it in my rearview mirror. You can see it moving around. It even stands up taller for a bit before ducking back down. I needed to see if I could get a better look because I was starting to second guess myself and what I was seeing. As I opened my car door and stepped out I moved to the back of my car and looked and I heard what sounded similar to a deep growl and it bolted into the trees. It was so fast I didn't get a good look at it. I cannot say 100% that what I am looking at is a dogman, but it's something let me know what you think. Since it was summer break for my school, I was lazily lounging at home watching TV. I got bored, so I went outside to see if I could do anything with my chickens like feed them worms and snails. Before I go into more detail, I should explain the area I live in. My home is on the outskirts of the city I live in. I had about five or seven chickens at the time, and we hadn't expanded the coop, so it was a small pen connecting to two sides of the chicken coop, which is wooden and sturdy. The only ways to get into the coop is either through the trap door attached to the big door and the three windows. One window is on one side of the door and the second window on the other side. The third window is a large window. Keep in mind that they all have traps connected to them so they can be closed. We have seven acres of woodland that we call the back pasture. And if you've ever been back there, you could see that it's a popular habitat for the local deer. There was also a wild boar that was roaming around at the time, and I don't know how it got there. We had been having trouble with poachers for a while, considering the population of deer in the woods. One poacher had set up a trail cam, one that was motion activated. There was an old rusty deer stand that had been put on a tree a long time ago, and the tree had begun to grow around it. Beyond our acres of woods, there's a large cornfield owned by our neighbors, and beyond that is a forest. I don't know what the forest is like beyond the field since we've never been there. I went outside to do something with my chickens, and I had brought along a bucket of corn for feeding the deer after. When I walked out of my home, I saw a doe was sitting in the tall grass. I thought it was sleeping since it had its head down and wasn't moving. I, being the curious little nut I was, decided that I would sneak up on the deer and get a picture of it to show to my mother when she got home from work. I crept as silently as I could across the yard that separated me from the deer. I should also mention that we have a clearing with a burn pit in it that was filled with cedar branches. I was creeping across my yard towards the deer, and when I had cleared the burn pit and was about ten yards from it, I realized that the deer wasn't asleep, but it was dead. It was the most disgusting sight I had ever seen. Its intestines were completely gone, the flesh on the body of the doe shredded to pieces and blood absolutely everywhere. It looked as if it had been sitting there for a while, and it smelled like it too. Most of the blood was dried and the air reeked with a stench of rotting flesh, urine, and what seemed like a hint of wet dog. Something that creeped me out about the scene was although it was a rotting carcass, there were no insects at all around it. It was as if the usual lively forest was deader than the deer. Not even the neighbor's cattle made a sound. It looked as if the poor deer had simply been left after being brutally attacked and half-eaten, which it most likely was. I left the bucket at the beginning of the trail, thinking that I would come out later with my mother and grain the deer when she got home. Then I started to walk back to my house. I had barely taken a few steps when I heard a low, snarling growl that sounded like a wolf, although it seemed distorted as if it were being played on an old radio. Sorry, that's the only way I think of describing it. Against my better judgment, I turned my head around, and I saw what looked like the biggest freaking wolf I'd ever seen. It was on all fours, its fur was black and matted in places. Its face was what you'd expect a wolf to look like although it was broad and the muzzle seemed a little short. Although the way it was curling its lips made it look as if its snout was plenty long, and its eyes were yellow. Not a bright yellow like the yellow of a flower or the sun, but a dim amber red yellow, if that makes sense. Its ears looked like that of a Doberman pincer, with the cropped effect. 
Its front legs were long, and it looked as if it were a bodybuilder. Its paws, if you can even call them paws, looked like huge hands with long claws at the end of them. It stood up, and I heard the most sickening popping sound you could ever imagine. It sounded like the sound of popping joints, but it seemed amplified as if it were being played through a microphone and the sound was coming out of loudspeakers. Its body looked like a bodybuilder's pumped up on steroids. It was so big. It had no tail that I could tell, and it seemed to tower over me. Although I was a good 10 meters from it, I was about 5 foot 4 inches at the time, and I came nowhere close to its height. It was so tall that the tip of its ears could almost touch the top of a young cedar. It let out a loud howl, which sounded more like a roar, and it charged at me. Doing the only thing I knew to do while hyped up on fear and adrenaline, I began to run away from it. I remember clearing my yard in what seemed like hours, but was most likely only a few seconds and running inside, slamming and locking all of the doors and windows. As I calmed down a small bit, I had realized that if it had really wanted to kill me that it would have. That what I had experienced was not an attack charge, but a bluff. I was lucky to get away with my life. Although this happened almost two years ago, it still terrifies me to think about it. The deer was gone the next day, and ever since that evening I have been weary around the woods, only going in them in broad daylight, only when I absolutely had to, and never without a weapon. Sadly, I cannot say that I am one of those people that have stopped experiencing things after the encounter, although I only had nightmares for a month after that day in June. Nothing really started to happen again until about two months ago, when I was staying up at night playing on the laptop. I had started to hear things moving around on the porch and turned on the light to see the shape of something huge disappearing behind the corner of my house. There was also one of the rare times I went into the woods after the first encounter when I was helping my mother clear brush from the hunting clearing. I was going to get the mower and was walking the trail to do so when I heard bipedal footsteps following me off to my side. They stopped whenever I stopped and I eventually ran out of the woods and I haven't been back since. I asked my late great-grandmother about the creature I had seen in the woods, and she informed me that there was something called the Wolfhead Man that stalked the Kansa tribe, preying on small children that strayed too far from their teepees. Later, I was informed by my history teacher that my house had actually been built on a tribal burial ground, and I have since been wondering if that had something to do with it. I hadn't heard about the wolf head man before she had told me about it. When I saw that there were several eyewitness reports that were proved to be truthful, it made me feel a lot better about coming out with this information. I had attempted to tell people previous to this submission, but everyone either said I was stupid, crazy, or just a plain liar. One thing's for certain, I am not stupid, I am not crazy, and I am most definitely not a liar. I know what I saw, and what I saw was a dogman. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.